Tonight we welcome, of course, Katya Single. But to give her a proper introduction, we're gonna bring a professional out here, a wonderful voice. Um, she's a fellow author, Mandy Jackson Beverly. She currently hosts the Bookshop Podcast. Check it out, it's very interesting. She's a book reviewer for the New York Journal of Books. She's also worked as a costume designer and stylist for virtually like a who's who of film, fashion, and music. Am I right? Uh, she's the author of the creative series, The Secret Muse, The Devil and the Muse, The Legend of Astrid Birth, and The Immortal Muse. Please welcome for our introducer, Mandy Jackson Beverly. Hi. Hi. Lovely to be here, Michael. What a lovely introduction. Thank you. Thank you all for coming this evening. Katya, I've known her for three years. And we finally met in person tonight, so that's been really exciting. She's one of my favorite authors, fantastic journalist, and just a, a lovely, lovely person. I, for one, am very grateful for Chaucer's. I am a huge supporter of independent bookshops, and uh, without them, our community doesn't look the same. So I really appreciate everybody buying your book from here tonight. That would be great. A little bit about Katia. Katia Sengel is a freelance writer and author based in California. Her work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Marie Claire, and the Wall Street Journal, among other publications. She has reported from North and Central America, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and was based in the former Soviet Union for half a decade. She was a features and news writer for the Louisville Courier Journal from 2003 to 2011. She has won prizes, notably the Eric Hoffer Academic Press in 2023, the Independent Book Award, which we call the Ippy Award in 2020, and Forward Indies 2019 winner. Her books are From Chernobyl with Love, reporting from the ruins of the Soviet Union, Exiled from the Killing Fields of Cambodia to California and Back, and Bluegrass Baseball, A Year in the Minor League Life. They're all wonderful. I don't know what to say. And her latest book, of course, is Straight Jackets and Lunch Money. It's a nonfiction memoir. It's wonderful. Um, so a little bit about, I, th I think we'll, I'll, I'll tell a synopsis. So about the book, Katia Single became patient number 0907151 at the Roth Psychosomatic Union uh, Unit at Children's Hospital at Stanford in 1986. She was 10 years old. Katia's young age set her apart from the other, mostly teenage children in that unit. Anorexic girls became her babysitters. Non-compliant diabetic boys were her big brothers. Instead of learning her multiplication tables, Sengel learned how to throw up. The bulimic teens taught her that. Visitors from other units showed her how to be ashamed. Hospital staff put her in a straitjacket and on antipsychotic medication. Her young age, the length of her stay, and her lack of diagnosis, diagnosis inspired a rare intimacy in staff and patients, allowing Katia to penetrate a hidden world more deeply than most. 30 years later, Katia, now a journalist, discovers her young age was not the only thing that made her hospital stay unusual. The idea of psychosomatic units themselves, where patients have dual medical and psychological diagnosis, was a revolutionary one. Since largely fallen out of favor, Katia documents this, tracking down doctors, psychologists, and counselors who once uh, cared for her. What happened to her as a child is told in the voice of the troubled 10-year-old girl she once was. The two narratives unfold simultaneously. The result? and I have to agree with this, is a gut-wrenching account of childhood mental illness told from the inside, interspersed with updates from experts in the field. Um, it really is a wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, it's just, you've done such a wonderful job. Um, so how about we start? This is a memoir of four months that you spent in the psychosomatic unit at the Children's Hospital, age 10. And it's about what you pieced together 30 years later. Having read your previous books and articles, I know your willingness to listen to people, to listen to children especially. Um, was this the impetus for you to write Straight Jackets and Lunch Money to encourage us, the readers, 
to listen to children speak? I think that really was the heart of it. As, as a child in that unit at that time, I, I felt um, like we were the people no one wanted to see. You know, we, w we were, when Santa came to visit, we were in the back. Um, and Santa even said he saved the toys for the real sick kids. Um, and, and we were just, we weren't a locked unit, but we might as well have been because it was the unit people didn't go to, right? It was the, the visitors who came to visit the kids didn't want to go to the psych. It was psychosomatic, but it was considered, you know, it was like shunned, hidden away. And so I think um, a lot of my life as a journalist was to kind of let people know about those, to not pu push people away, and especially yeah. children. Um, so I think it, when I look back on it, when I wrote this book, I was kind of like, oh, that's kind of led a lot of my career path in many ways, um, to encourage people um, not to, whether you put them in an institution or not, but it was a bigger thing I, I started realizing when I wrote it. It was about institutionalizing kids in general, um, and what that does, um, in some cases, actually, it is, you need an escape from a bad situation, but then just not to forget about these kids and to show you do care about them, you know, to acknowledge them and not to, if they make you uncomfortable, um, that's okay, but still be there for them. Don't yeah. avoid them because they make you uncomfortable. And we'll talk about that um, a little later regarding uh, what you were going through and how you ended up there. But one thing I do want to, and, and this really fascinates me, is how you came about writing and remembering what happened then. And it does go back to your work with children. Um, so can you talk about that a little bit, please? Yeah, is that where I should read the I extra? Think so. okay. I think so, yeah. We slammed this out and then it was like, wait, what did we, we slam? <laughs> um, so, in, it's funny, those of you who've read my other books know um, I often tackle dark things, but I do tend to use humor. Um, in this book, even though it is dark, um, there is also actually humor, especially the child voice. Um, uh, so I'm just going to read a really short excerpt um, that um, ex kind of explains what um, Mandy was just talking about. The Prisoners, 2012. It was the straitjacket. I had forgotten it. I'm not sure how. Having your arms held forcibly immobile against your body is not something you would think one would forget. It is especially hard to imagine someone like myself, someone who hates to lose control, forgetting having been forced to watch as others took control. But I had forgotten how they overpowered my brain and my will. They took my anger and wrapped me up in it, forcing me to absorb the pain I needed to release. I was 10 years old. A captive, a prisoner. The straitjacket makes you helpless to protect yourself, to defend yourself, to hurt yourself. How do you forget something like that? I don't know, but I did. I had forgotten about the straitjacket until I saw them forcibly restrain another child, a boy, a teenager. He was fighting them. I didn't want to stare, but I had to look closer. The stiff white contraption that was holding his arms unnaturally at his side seemed familiar. That's when I remembered. I had seen it before. I had felt it before. More than two decades had passed, but a memory was coming back. I wasn't sure if it was real. Real was what I was seeing now. A black teenager incarcerated in a youth detention facility in the greater San Francisco Bay Area for a crime I was not supposed to know, being forced into a straitjacket. As an instructor in a weekly writing program at the facility, I'd been warned against inquiring about the youth's crimes. I hadn't been volunteering with the program long, but I knew already it was better not to ask too many questions of the children, especially when you had no answers you could give them. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, so writing this, was it easier for you to step into Katia, the journalist's shoes, or did you, um, was it just as easy to be cutty as a little girl? That was, I was really interested in that reading the book. The journalist, and I, I've heard another journalist say that, and we've got a <clears throat> young, promising journalist in our audience today. I won't draw attention to her. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, but as a journalist, um, 
another journalist had said this too, it's like your notebook, it's protection. You can ask all these questions and do all these uncomfortable things because you've kind of got this role to play and you can be the journalist. And once I have my notebook out, I'm much more comfortable and I can do these things. I don't think going back and talking to the psychiatrist who had treated me as a 10 year old, I could have done if I wasn't in, you might want to talk to me at that point too, like I didn't have a reason. But journalism gave me this opening. So um, that was still really hard to go back to and it didn't work with all of them. There were very different reactions to the um, doctors and um, counselors. Some that really surprised me um, that I, I wanted to go back and talk to. The childhood part was actually one of the first things I ever really wrote. It was when I was in college, I started um, writing and I uh, was in creative writing courses and there was a personal narrative course and this was just what came. And I used the original thing was kind of what a 19 year old would write and very self-absorbed and bigger. But so I got rid of that years later, but I held the core childhood memories because they were more immediate. When I was 19, I was only nine years away from this. Um, but it was, it was too, so some of that core I held there and that was incredibly difficult to write at the time, but it was, um, what, when I started writing, it's what I had to write. Um, and I remember, yeah, the, the professor I had then, um, just saying, it's clear you have a voice that you have something to say. And so that was really what I wanted to say. Yeah. Well, you did a great job. Um, you know, while anorexia is a big part of the story, it's rooted in depression, right? And I don't want to give too much away in the story because there is a something that happens with your dad that is uh, kind of climactic. But when you read over a little bit, it doesn't kind of hit you like that until way later. And I was like, oh my God. Um, and you and I have had this conversation before. Um, I'm a recovered alcoholic and that book and drug addict and that actually came from depression from a 14 year old girl and I've been sober for over 30 years now but you're always in recovery right so let's talk about that depression as a little girl and I was wondering have you been able to actually talk about this with a psychologist now you know and, and confronted that trauma yeah, I think as a, as a kid, um, yeah, my dad, I was in a, a home situation I, I couldn't really get out of, so I found the best escape um, I could, and you're 10 years old. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no one's listening to you, you make them listen however you can. Um, and so it's funny, I, I well, anorexic is um, correct, it's also, that almost came later. They wouldn't give me a diagnosis because I was young, and also today, I don't like children who are young being given a label because then they tend to fit into that label, right? So, um, and that was one thing one of the therapists said when I went back, that's why I was not labeled because they don't want to label you such, but um, one, um, oh, when I was asking. Oh, depression, yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> so yes, that, that's where it started with. I, I um, my dad was severely depressed and he had had trauma himself that he just wasn't able to care for a child in the right way or, or to do things. And I um, tried to save him and that wasn't working. And so then I kind of just instead got stuck in, sucked into his depression. Um, and I think it is something um, that you deal with throughout your life. And as far as therapists, <laughs> there's some funny scenes with therapists in there at first. My mom didn't have um, a ton of money, so she sent me to like this practicing therapist um, <laughs> who was not, not, not very good. Um, I just found out the other day, I was like, oh, where'd that picture go that we have? She's like, oh, Rebecca still has it. She never gave it back. So anyhow, um, she, she was uh, not certified yet for a reason, but, and then, so I didn't, 10 years old, I didn't talk to them. I usually, um, felt it was a challenge to be silent and to show them up that I wasn't gonna, you know, I didn't, that wasn't gonna work for me. Kids kind of, they act out a lot of times or internalize instead, and they don't even, I don't know if I even had the words yeah. to talk to a therapist, but years mm -hmm. later I did, um, and on and off over the years have talked, and of course it really, really helped, and I think it's something 
uh, you you deal with. It's not something that ever. I did another interview recently, and he's like, oh, "Okay, so then you got better." And I'm like, "Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, yeah. it's it's recovery. Um, but it's recovery it, it's, it's something that yeah. you um, always is, is with you, and there's yeah. always something there." Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you know, you brought up something then that I find fascinating, and you do talk about a little in the book, and that's inherited suffering. Um, when you have, and it's, I don't think you know this when you're a kid. But I know I'm looking at it now, and you look at it in the book, and you start to think, was I picking up on something that was inherited from my father, who maybe inherited that suffering from his father, and your father was in uh, which war? No, know. no, he wasn't in the war he at all. No, 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 he was in something like that, wasn't No, no, his uncle was. His uncle. Oh, my God, that's right. I remember that story. And I can't tell it right now because it's a big part of the book, can I? No. Um. It is a climactic part of the book. Okay. But I don't know. I think the words that what he told, what your dad told you about him was kind of a catalyst, right? Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. Share I that mean, or not? Yeah. I think it's a good idea. Who oh, do I'm it? <laughs> You do it. You do it. You do it. So, um, my dad told me when he was a kid about how he was teased and they, they came up with this rhyme, Jingle Jangle, Here Comes Sangle, which is our last name. And it developed, he, he was in a immigrant town um, outside Chicago. And so I, from what I understand, it was a kind of enclosed community where people knew each other. And um, when he was a kid, his uncle, who had served in the war, um, uh, killed his two children and his wife and then himself. And it was in the newspapers and it was a really pretty brutal murder and all that. And that's when my dad got teased afterwards with the jingle jangle, here comes single. But my dad told me this when I was about 10 years old about his depressed uncle. I'm sitting there looking at my dad who's super depressed. And he told me it was two little girls. But when I look back at it, I think his cousins were a boy and a girl, I'm not sure. Um, but so I'm like, hmm depressed dads kill their kids in their sleep. <laughs> and yeah. I mean, it, it, I'm laughing now, but it, it just, yeah. it really, oh. you know, you don't really know what to do with that. No, you don't. And so your way was to just back off from everything, really. Yeah. And I love this story. Um, maybe you can talk a little about lunch money. Oh, the title in the book, Straight Jackets and Lunch yeah, Money. Yeah, yeah, we kind of got to the straight jackets yeah, already. Yeah, we did, so. we did. <laughs> the lunch money also had to do with my dad. And, um, you know, part of this is I was probably an overly sensitive kid. Um, my sister, my dad would be depressed and be like, oh, you're going to leave your poor dad here and go out and play? And my sister's like, yep, see ya. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I wasn't good at that, so I would stay with my dad. And dad had lost his job, and oh, poor poor guy and he liked people feeling sorry for him and there's no money for gas to drive us to school there's no money for things so I thought oh well I get a dollar for lunch every day why don't I just save my dollar and in a while I'll have like this big stack of money I can give to dad and impress him and he won't be feeling sorry for himself all the time because he has money mm -hmm. um, and so that's how I started stopping eating was um, to save the money and then it became almost uh, obsession. It was yeah. like, oh, and also it was like, oh, no one notices I don't eat, so why do I eat breakfast? Why do I eat dinner? And oh, let's see how far I can take this before mm -hmm. people stop yeah. it, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, again, this is a 10 year old thinking that it's not exactly yeah. rational. Yeah. But I think that's something as a society, as a community, we need to be listened to more. We need to be listened to those voices because you said a little while ago. Um, oh, we'll just slot that under anorexia, we'll slot that under this, 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 without really going into, well, what, what causes, why was she depressed in the first place? And had hmm. you been able to tell that story, I think it would have been a huge difference, maybe. I think there's a really good story I heard from um, a psychiatrist when I was doing this book mm -hmm. that's in here, and he talked about this young kid, and that goes to the psychosomatic illness. That's the idea of treating mental and physical together. Yes. Um, and we get it, I get into in the book about how that developed and how it's changed now. But this kid, it was a young boy, maybe eight or very young, um, and he suddenly stopped walking. And no one could figure out why he stopped walking. 
um, and they, they were asking all these questions, doing all these things, doing all these tests. There was no reason for, I think it was, don't quote me on this when you read the book, it might be a different syndrome, but there was something he, he did physically that there was no explanation for. Mm -hmm. And so they started asking more and more questions and they're like, okay, well the house is being painted, maybe it's um, paint pollution. chips or, or, yeah. or pollution from that. And they're like, no, and they kept looking. And finally they were like, okay, wait, why is the house being painted? House is being painted because I think it was his older brother was moving back home. Why was older brother not there? Older brother had molested his sister before. And so this kid was really nervous about this older brother coming back, but he couldn't articulate that. And so it manifested in a physical thing. And it took a lot of patience on the part of doctors to actually figure this out and to look at both the physical and the mental together. It's like doing detective work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's I'm, it's just fascinating. I, that's, I really found that fascinating within the book. I really started to understand um, the philosophies behind trying to talk to children, or with children perhaps is the, is the best way to put it. Now in the chapter titled The Comprehensive Care Unit, you revisit where the Roth unit once was. Um, and it was part of the Children's Hospital at Stanford. You write, quote, the ostracism I felt as a child is complete. Exile is no longer metaphorical. It is also physical. The, hospi the hospital is top rate, too good in fact, for any of the germs of the Roth unit. They have been moved to El Camino Hospital, which was undergoing its own reconstruction when the comprehensive care unit got kicked out, end quote. So what brought about the closure? of the Roth unit, and what has the community lost with that closure? Um, quick answer, money. Um, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> the hospitals like to have the prestigious things that use a lot of the equipment, the big heart surgeries, those things that um, actually cost a lot of money, make a lot of money, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. uh, psychosomatic kids just sit there for a long time mm -hmm. and they, they don't bring in money. Um, and, and so people, a lot of hospitals have gotten rid of those units and gotten rid of um, psych units and the beds. Um, and so it was like a slow thing where they did and then they finally moved it over there. But it's, if you read, I think it's with adults too, but I paid more attention to kids. Um, and there's, there was a recent PBS thing that was really good about, yeah, there just aren't enough beds anymore. It, it was never really profitable. There's even, I, I go in there about the idea of the psychosomatic units was actually to make it a little bit more profitable for practicing um, psychiatrists because they weren't able to kind of um, stay afloat. So um, it's, I mean, it's, it is what it is. You know, you've got to have money yeah. to keep things going, but um, it is, uh, that was a lot to do yeah. with the decision. Um, and so when you were there, they had this part of the hospital, not only did it have the medical team, but you had a psychological team and they worked together with trying to help these children. I mean, it just makes so much sense, doesn't it? Yeah, and it was one of the first um, ones for kids like that. And so we had, the head was, I knew the psychiatrist had better, but it was a man and a woman. The psychiatrist was a man and then um, the woman was the medical doctor and they both consulted on every case and did that. And then we also had, we're lucky they didn't call them, we had, um, uh, what did, I call them counselors, that wasn't their official title, but that's what they were. And those were the people who actually made the biggest difference because they were just there for you no matter what. And they were younger, right? They, yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they were. So that probably helped. Yeah. You could relate to them, yeah. Oh my goodness. Now, you and I were talking yesterday about an, a wonderful article in The Atlantic. It came out uh, just a couple of days ago, and it was written by Rachel Gutman Wing. Um, and it's titled, We Have No Drugs to Treat the Deadliest Eating Disorder. And the question is, there are pills for bulimia and binge eating disorder. Why not anorexia? Um, and the, I'm gonna read the last quote, which was uh, written by uh, Scott Crow. He's an adjunct psychology professor at the University of Minnesota. He writes, quote, Research on de eating disorders tends to be underfunded on the whole. That stems in part from a widely prevailing belief that this is something that people could or should stop. I wish that were how it works, frankly, but it's not. That was just heartbreaking to me, Rina, and I know that really hounded you, that last phrase, 
Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and I think it was really interesting when I was interviewing um, Dr. Hans Steiner, who was uh, the psychiatrist that ran um, Roth and unfortunately passed away um, after I interviewed him, but before the book came out, but um, he was older. Uh, and he was explaining that when you starve yourself, you sedate, you, you, it's like a tranquilizer, right? Mm -hmm. So all your uh, depression, anxiety, it kind of, you don't have the energy for any of that. Yeah. So it, it, it's a solution for these um, people. And then if you start giving someone food automatically, all the anxiety, all of that comes back. And mm -hmm. um, so it's not as simple as just giving them food. And I remember I had, food was one thing in my life I could control. I couldn't control anything else. And so when they took like with the straight jacket, when they took that one thing away from me, I'm fighting it because I don't, um, and physically it just was hard. I think all those emotions came back when I had energy, whereas when I didn't eat, I didn't, I was numb. And that worked because I didn't want to feel um, mm -hmm. things. So yeah, I think, I think that is so key what he was saying. Yeah, yeah there's no quick fix, is there? Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, and is there one individual story uh, a fellow patient, if you wish, um, in that unit that you actually remember uh, that's kind of left an image on you? Yeah, um, Erica, and the hard thing was for me, I tried to track down some of the patients, but I only knew their first names because I was a kid. Um, and patient confidentiality, I can't get that um, mm -hmm. information. I did know some doctors who knew them who reached out asking if they wanted to talk to me and none of them got in touch um but yeah erica was admitted same day right around the same time as me and she was just a year different than me but she had already been in one or two hospitals she basically um was one of those that might spend much of their life in an institution um because she was already at that young age headed that way um but then again maybe she didn't um so i i i she's the one i um definitely wonder so about yeah. yeah and this is always one of my favorite questions what are you currently reading yeah i'm glad that i can't remember the title but it's really good it's a non-fiction book and it's um this woman in like 1910 or something her oh he wasn't even her husband he was her fiance he disappeared in Africa, and so she goes to track him down, but so far, she's really not spending much time tracking him down. She's just having her own adventure, and it's oh. great. <laughs> she's doing all the things like they're telling her she shouldn't do as a woman in 1910 in Africa, and yeah. so, um, and she has a great sense of humor, uh, but it's also, you, you're left wondering, okay, is she gonna find him? What happened to yeah. him? So, and yeah. I, it's, it's a new nonfiction title I got at the library, and I, totally forgot the name. Oh my gosh. Well, you'll have to let us know, baby. I, I will. Michael can put it in, okay. the, in the thing. Because it's really good. Oh yeah. Any questions from anybody who would like to ask Katya a question? Katya, how, how has this been a redemptive experience for you? Good question. Mm, I don't know yet because it just came out. So, <laughs> um, I think the, the original, um, You'll have to get back to me, you know, in a couple months. Um, it is definitely very different from any of my other books, so um, it, it's harder for me to judge and to do, so it's, it's kind of unknown territory for me. Mm. You know, it's funny because when you finish writing a book, people say, I hope you're ready because for the next couple of years, that's all you're going to be asked questions about is that book. And that's tricky, isn't it? It's, it's hard. It yeah, because by then I wrote it. You know, it takes a while for it to come out. Yes, so I wrote yes. it a yeah. year or a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, oh, yeah. well, I've kind of moved on. But then you go back. So yes. it's, yeah. it's interesting. It's, yeah, it is interesting. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Yes. I'd like to know how or what, were, what was the scenario of circumstances that led you to go into this facility? Um, How did that happen? Did your parents put you there? Oh, oh okay, you, yeah. You know, um, did did uh, you, uh, somebody find you on the street somewhere, starving to <laughs> yeah, death? No, no, no. What? No, and um, 
<laughs> By the way, I have a lot of family here, and a lot of family actually really supported me. Um, I just, uh, I think a lot of people didn't know what to do. Um, and so uh, my mom did her best, but she was a single working mom, um, and she really couldn't, she was in over her head. Um, and so she was taking me to the doctor, uh, and the doctor weighed me, and finally the doctor was just like, we've got to put her in a hospital, she's gonna die. Um, and so um, they did, but the day I went in, my dad insisted nothing was wrong with me. Um, I was just a little skinny like he was, so it was like, but, but my mom was, um, would have been better if it was done earlier, but my mom did was on yeah. get that along with the doctor so that they finally got that. Mm. Mm. Any other questions? How long was the writing process? Ah, leave it to a writer. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca, remind us again where, who you write for? Uh, I write for News Talk, a local news site in town. Look for Rebecca's byline. She's one of my former students, a star student. <laughs> um, I teach journalism uh, at Cal Poly, for those who don't know. Um, uh, so, gosh, it took some of those doctors, it was on and off, you know, like you're juggling the different projects and some of the doctors um, weren't getting back to me in a timely manner. So I want to say that part, the journalism part where I went back and did that may have taken as much as two years, but not full time at all. It was just getting them and then, uh, and then the earlier part when I was a kid, uh, kid, college student, I probably did in about two quarters or so. Um, but then there were a lot of rewrites because I then wrote it as fiction at one point and then I switched it from fiction to nonfiction and then I, I, I played around with it a lot actually. So it's had a lot of versions. Mm -hmm. mm. Are you happy with, you've written it as a nonfiction memoir? You know, I liked the fiction, but I was alone in that. <laughs> no one else liked the fiction version. Oh gosh, yeah. Well, not no one, but the few people I showed it to were like, it'd be so much more powerful, nonfiction. And so I trusted them and that's all what I do mostly is nonfiction. So um, I, I guess, again, get back to me on that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That. I'll ask you in another year. Oh, I've got another question. What were your feeling when you finished it? You know, when you'd finished writing it and it was complete and... You know, again, it's funny. It's like you finish it, I'm like, okay, done with that. But then it's not done because then you right. got to sell it. And then you got to... Oh, oh. Well, the book, but your feelings. You know? Oh, just feelings. Maybe that's a hard <laughs> thing. I, you know. I, I think I just... I, I definitely compartmentalized, so I think it was like... Okay, I, I have to be in the right mood. I had to be in the right mood to write it. Uh -huh. I had to be in the right mood to talk about it. So I think when I was done with that, I was like, okay, I can kind of go away from that for a while. Mm -hmm. The end part, if I remember, I was in a pretty bad place again. And so the writing helped me, but it also, I, I was kind of sinking down with it. So um, I think I was like, oh God, yes, done, I, I think. But it's so, it, it is so wonderful to bring out all of that so we could understand it too. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I thought maybe it would be like, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not as good at no. articulating it. I can write it. No, <laughs> I, that's, that's, I think, that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. One of the things I think that it, I found from reading this book, and I did mention it earlier, is that it makes me more aware. Yeah. Um, it, it helps me remember to listen to children. Um, and that I think is huge. I'm gonna get teary because I, I think that's huge. what I wanted. I think yeah. that that is exactly what I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And you don't have to have a solution because I think most of the time there isn't one, unfortunately. Yeah. But just being there, listening to them, seeing them, and not walking away when it's uncomfortable, and not just just yeah. looking at them, really looking at them. Did you have crayons and? all that kind of stuff when you were a kid? Did you tend to draw much or write much when you were a little girl? I wrote when I was little. I, I okay, used to good. do, do yeah. and yeah, things. I was, I was wondering about that. Have you still got some of those pieces? Somewhere, yeah. I think yeah. that they're not very good. <laughs> but they're coming There are a lot about heart. teddy bears. Oh, that's okay. It's okay. Teddy bears and things that you have to love, right? Um, any other questions? No? Can't 
Maria, you have written such a wonderful book, and I'm so proud of you. Um, this is a great book. Pick it up. Tell your friends about it. Make sure they come to Chaucer's to buy it if they're in Santa Barbara or to any of their local indie bookshops. Katia, you're a gem. Thank you. And I want to say thank you so much to Chaucer's. Yeah. I've done two, three here. I don't know. Yeah. I've done uh, there. It, well, and I did one at the library and Chaucer's yeah. support it. Great, great bookstore. Um, the best in the Central Coast. I can say that because Slows, where I live, does not have <laughs> they they, they oh need this is a, a gem um and then also listen to mandy's podcast it's amazing and she also has really good books <laughs> right. thank you both thank you, thank you. Thank you.